The coniferous forests of British Columbia cover over 50% of the province. Some of the heaviest forests are in the coastal mountains and valleys. Soil development is quite different from the chernisms, although the parent material is often a similar origin. This is the UBC research forest 40 kilometers east of Vancouver. We're right on the edge of a terrace that was formed near the end of the last glaciation. About two meters below us, there's a marine deposit. And during glaciation, the ice deposited some glacial till right here. But the ice dammed a lake just to the east of us. When the ice melted away, that uh, dam broke. And the water from that lake flowed across here, carrying away the silt and clay, and leaving behind the gravel, the boulders, and the sand. So that's the, the parent material from which this soil was formed. And that's the kind of landscape situation in which this soil developed. For most of the period since glaciation, the climate is thought to have been essentially what it is today, wet and temperate with over 2,000 millimeters of rain annually. Coniferous forests, dominated by western hemlock, thrived for centuries and deposited their leaf litter on the soil surface. OK, right up at the top, we have the forest floor material, the organic layers. And those include the very fresh litter, some F horizon and H horizon. And down below that is the mineral soil. And, it, and the mineral soil includes an AP horizon, P for plow. This uh, horizon has been cultivated during mechanical site preparation before the present stand was planted. Just below this, very recent AP horizon is the AE. That's the leached, bleached, grayish horizon from which the iron has been removed. Below that, a BHF horizon, that is a B horizon which has accumulated quite a bit of organic matter as well as oxidized iron. That's not very thick. Just below it, we find this BF material In fact, we might call it a BFC. It's slightly cemented. It still has the bright, rusty orange colors that we associate with oxidized iron. But as we move down further, we find more yellowish colors, not quite so much iron accumulation. And then down here, something that's quite interesting, it's transitional from the B horizon to the C. It has some of the characteristics of the B horizon, some of the characteristics of the C horizon, but some other characteristics that are all its own. Because of this very compact, dense material that's down at the bottom, we have an impermeable layer. So that in this high rainfall environment, there are times of the year when there may be standing water over this impermeable layer. And it gets very wet. We have fluctuating, oxidizing, and reducing conditions. And we can see the results of that here with some of this iron flecking. There are some gray or yellow colors, and then some reddish mottles that are associated with the oxidizing conditions. So that is some kind of a BCGJ horizon, a weekly glide horizon. So overall then, what we have is a podzolic soil which belongs to the humoferic podzol grape group. Humoferic because it's dominated by a BF horizon. And if we wanted to classify it to the subgroup level, we would call it a glide humoferic podzol because of the modeling down in the bottom of the B horizon. The sandiness and gravel content of this soil makes it ideal to work with for many engineering purposes. Roads can be built without having to transport in gravel. It can be driven on with heavy bulldozers and skidders during harvest without concern about extreme physical degradation of the soil. 
The lack of clay and silt, however, creates problems for the growing trees. Firstly, the water retention capacity of these soils is poor, allowing them to dry out quickly under the frequent summer droughts. Secondly, with such a low clay and silt content, the soil has a limited ability to retain nutrients. There's relatively little in the way of organic matter accumulation, too. And organic matter is the second component that's particularly important for retaining nutrients. So one can, can infer from that that this is a, a rather nutrient poor soil. And the growth rates in this stand of Douglas fir reflect that. Probably the most limiting nutrient here is nitrogen. And if one were to try to improve the fertility of this soil, probably the, the place to begin would be by applying about 200 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, perhaps as urea. That's the conventional nitrogen fertilizer application in forestry in this area. When it comes to some other management practices, uh, slash burning is a practice that's often carried out in this region. And we still don't know exactly what the long-term implications are of slash burning on a soil like this. We have some information from other soils elsewhere in the region, but we still don't have enough information to enable us to predict what the long-term implications are. We know that in the short term, growth is often pretty good, and sometimes nutrition is quite good after burning. But the question is whether the loss of nutrients by volatilization, loss in fly ash, loss by leaching, may mean some nutritional problems that are pretty serious in the long run. Now you're talking about soil chemistry. Uh, my understanding is these soils are relatively acid. Uh, that will have nutritional effects, but also effects on soil biology. So perhaps we should say a few words about that as well. This soil is quite acid. Up near the surface, the pH is down around three and a half. So that's quite strongly acid. Certainly there are no earthworms in this soil. Uh, there's a very, very small bacterial population. Most of the decomposition that's going on up in these layers is carried out by soil fungi. There's not very much diversity of soil animal population. In fact, uh, the fungi are important not only in decomposition, but they're also important in, directly in tree nutrition. Some of these tree roots have fungi growing on the root tips. And those Associations of fungi with root tips are called mycorrhizae, and these mycorrhizae are especially important for the phosphorus nutrition of the trees. If the trees did not have those fungi associated with them, they would probably be acutely phosphorus deficient. Now, the mycorrhizae also help in nitrogen nutrition and uh, some aspects of, of uh, uptake of other nutrients, too, but it's mostly the phosphorus nutrition that's particularly important. So the biology of these soils is, is uh, interesting. Not much diversity of populations, but certainly the soil organisms are extremely important for the nutrition of, of plants growing on this site. If BC is to maintain its forest-based economy, it means that soils like these podzils will have to continue to support good tree growth. What are some of the concerns of soil management in our forests? Under more intensive management, there are more entries into the stand. And that can sometimes pose a problem because of compaction and the other problems that go along with vehicles driving around over the soil. But this soil, is, as we've seen because of its coarse texture, stands up pretty well under that kind of treatment. I think one of the most serious concerns is that with repeated frequent logging, and particularly with thinning of young trees, we'll be looking at much larger and more frequent nutrient removals from these kinds of soils. So we'll have to, have to take greater pains in maintaining the fertility of these soils. In the past, we tended to look at the forest soil as a renewable resource, something that we could 
just mine. We could grow trees and take the trees away and not have to worry about putting nutrients back. But with intensive cropping, it becomes as important to worry about nutrients on these soils as on agricultural soils. 